Hey YouTube, this is Ozark's brother Jerry, and uh, man, this is probably going to be long, but I don't know how else to get around it, and we won't do it justice, regardless how much time we spend on it. But I want to talk about the United Nations Global Compact for Safe, Orderly, and Regular Migration. Um, now I know Trump's already said he's not going to sign this thing, but you know they're making a big deal. They found a second child that died in ICE custody today, so they're going to keep pushing this. They're going to keep pushing this. So uh, I want to start off by reading an article written by Victoria Friedman, and it was published on Breitbart yesterday, 25 December. Um, <clears throat> 2018 was the year of the United Nation, the year that the United Nations made it first. Let me start over with that. 2018 was the year that the United Nations made its first attempt at the global governance of migration, a move rejected by patriotic countries like the United States, Hungary, Israel, and Australia. On December 19th, 152 countries at the UN General As Assembly in New York City voted in favor of adopting the Global Compact for Safe, Orderly, and Regular Migration. A dozen countries abstained, including Australia and Italy, and five countries voted against it. Three in the European Union, the United States, Hungary, the Czech Republic, Poland, and Israel. The UN began drafting the document in response to Europe's migrant crisis of 2015 fueled by German Councillor Angela, Angela Merkel unilaterally suspending the EU regular asylum rules and throwing open the gates to more than one million migrants from the third world. In a robust defense of the migration document in November, Chancellor Merkel launched an attack on European nations considering rejecting the compact, calling them nationalist and the pejorative, claiming such countries are not patriotic. Imagine that, you bad people are nationalists. To her, patriotism means being loyal to the party, you know. Where do we hear that in the late 30s and 40s? Later that month, it was revealed that Merkel, the architect of Europe's migrant crisis, had been the main driving force for the international documents and had been working on it as early as 2016. And while the document could not assert itself to be legally binding, uh, Germany sought for it to be considered politically binding. So they're saying it's not legally binding, but now the experts are saying it does constitute a legal framework. <laughs> Supporters of this major piece of global governance claim that it will stop illegal migration, will set out a cooperative framework for dealing with global mass migration, and aims to protect the human rights and fundamental freedom of all migrants. However, the document does not acknowledge in one instance the existence of illegal immigration. The word illegal not appearing at all. Um, and I'll tell you another word that I find conspicuously missing is the word God. Okay? <laughs> Never is God or religion mentioned in this in this document. Um Likewise, the word stop, as in stopping illegal immigration or mass migration, and its derivation, derivations only appear once. In, in reference to UN nations committing to stopping the allocation of public funding or material support to media outlets deemed to be promoting intolerance, xenophobia, racism, and other forms of discrimination towards migrants in their reporting. So, you know, what they're saying is, is uh, funding could be held, could be withheld from media outlets that, that cast illegal migration in a bad light. So much for, you know, transparency, but we'll get into that more. A factor which may have persuaded so many nations to back the document with the assurances that the compact is non-legally binding. In fact, that phrase appears only twice in the document. While, quote, we commit to, unquote, quote, commit, unquote, or, quote, commitment, 
quote, appear a total of 86 times. Despite assurances from liberal progressives that signing the international contact would not infringe on a country's legal rights to determine immigration policy, experts have noted the UN contact occupied a legal gray area which gives the impression of state liability and could be used by open borders, activists, and civil society groups to interpret national immigration law. Dutch MEP and co-president of the Europe of Nations and Freedom group, Marcel Del Graaf, warned that the contact is still the legal framework on which participating countries commit themselves to build new legislation. Calling it a legalization, calling it a legalization of mass migration. The Dutch populace said it's declaring a migration, it's declaring migration a human right, and said he believed the contact could be used as a basis for making criticism of mass migration illegal. And that's that's this whole deal, is this making migration an implicit right, you know, for the world's citizens. One basic element of this new agreement is the extensive is the extension of the definition of hate speech. Criticism of migration will become a criminal offense. Media outlets that give room to criticism of migration can be shut down, he claimed. The United States was the first country to say that it would not support the migration compact a full year before it was signed in December 2017. U.S. officials said that the pact contains numerous provisions that are inconsistent with U.S immigration and refugee policies and the Trump administration's immigration principles. The move was consistent with President Donald Trump's America First policies and he was criticized by the establishment media and global elite, but the move broke the spell and gave leave to other patriotic nations to put the rights of their citizens first and ensure the continued sanctity of their national borders. Addressing the UN General Assembly in September 2018, President Trump reiterated his rejection of the compact, saying migration should not be governed by an international body unaccountable to our own citizens. Ultimately, the only long-term solution to the migration crisis is to help people build more hopeful futures in their home countries, President Trump said. Make their countries great again. That's right. Hungary told the UN last week it reserved the sovereign right to decide on migration and security measures, but was the first country to back President Trump in rejecting the compact. This document is entirely against Hungary's security matters, Foreign Minister Peter Cesarto said in July. Its main premise is that immigration, excuse me, its main premise is that migration is a good and inevitable phenomenon. We consider I want to interrupt in that quote there, you know, it's uh, an inevitable phenomenon. What do they tell us about China and, you know, their economy? Oh, it's inevitable. China's going to rule the globe. And there's nothing you can do about it. You know, that's just another tactic that uh, these globalists use. So let me start over with this Peter Cesardo's quote. It's main, main, and he's the foreign minister of Hungary. Its main premise is that migration is a good and inevitable phenomenon. We consider migration a bad process, which has extremely serious security implications, Mr. Cesarto added. Hungary's partners in the Visegrad group of Eastern European nations, Poland, the Czech Republic, and Slovakia, later joined in rejecting the compact. In October, Poland's interior minister, Joachim Brudzinski said the draft agreement did not adequately guarantee sovereign border rights, nor does it distinguish legal and illegal migration. We want Poles to be safe in their country, the minister added. In November, Czech Prime Minister Andrzej Babis called the pact dangerous because it defines migration as a basic human right, while Slovakia's Prime Minister Peter Pellegrini said Slovakia considers economic migration illegal harmful, and a security risk. Fellow Eastern European countries, Bulgaria, Latvia, and Romania also abstained. While the establishment in Brussels held 
the Eastern Front in contempt for rejecting the compact. It should have come as hardly a surprise given that conservative patriotic countries like Hungary and Poland have long clashed with the bloc in the past over its progressive agenda. The rejection of the migration pact by Western European Austria, which currently holds the rotating presidency of the Council of the EU, however, may have come as more of a surprise. In October, the conservative Austrian Chancellor Sebastian Kurz said his government was seriously concerned about the content and objectives of the UN Migration Compact and that his country would continue to determine for itself who could enter. Following the migrant crisis, the entire power structure in the country and its position on immigration flipped over the 10-year rule of the Social Democrats supported by the conservative Austrian People's Party. It was replaced in a... Let me start that over. I think I, I messed that up. Following the migrant crisis, the entire power structure in the country and its position on immigration flipped over the 10-year rule of the Social Democrats supported by the conservative Austrian People's Party was replaced. These people need to use some grammar, like some commas. Was replaced in October 2017 elections with a government led by the OVP support, supported in coalition with the right-wing populist Freedom Party of Austria, the new government enacting tough new immigration policies. The European Commission said it regretted Austria's decision, while its president, Jean-Claude Juncker, later uh, attacking stupid populists for the bloc's splitting in two over the compact. In November, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu confirmed that he had instructed foreign, the foreign ministry to announce that Israel won't participate and won't sign the Migration Pact. We have a duty to protect our borders against illegal infiltrators. That's what we've done, and that's what we will continue to do, Prime Minister Netanyahu said. Likud Party Deputy Foreign Minister Zippy Hotovli welcomed the decision, saying the government must stand for a clear migration policy that protects our borders from illegal infiltrators. The small Jewish state is an oasis of liberal democracy in Middle East, in the Middle East, where there are few friendly states and many hostile fundamental Islamic ones. The compact would encourage the, the compact would risk encouraging illegal entry and reverse Australia's hard-won successes in combating the people smuggling trade, Prime Minister Scott Morrison said in a statement in late November. Adding that the migration compact was not in Australia's interest, that the Antipodian government, I had to look up Antipodian, it means diametrically opposite. <laughs> in the dictionary it says Australians use use this a lot. The in, so I'll start over. <laughs> Adding that the migration compact was not in Australia's interest, the Antipodian government said, we do not believe that adopting this agreement will add anything to enhancing our capacity to control our borders and manage our successful migration program. Prime Minister Morrison was an influential architect of the country's very successful Operation Sovereign Borders, which brought an end to asylum seekers asylum seeker arrivals at sea by turning boats back and processing claims and centers offshore. And you know, that's, and what's Trump doing? He's, he's processing these people while they're in their asylum request while they're in Mexico. You know, that's a very similar strategy. One man who wants to roll back his country's pledges to the migration pact is conservative president of Brazil, Herr Bolsonaro called the Trump of the tropics, the anti-establishment populist crusader has pledged to root out government corruption, get tough on crime, and take back control of his country's borders. Unfortunately, Brazil with the current foreign minister has signed the pact. It has to be rigorous criteria to enter Brazil. We will denounce and revoke this pact for migration, President-elect Bolsonaro said last week according to the Real Times. Incoming foreign minister Ernesto Arujo called the contact an inappropriate instrument to deal with illegal immigration, illegal migration, and said countries should make their own policies. Immigration shouldn't be treated as a global issue, but rather in accordance 
with the reality of each country, Mr. Araujo said. Brazil may be the first to pull out of the compact, having committed to it, but it may not be the last. So, the uh, UN Global Compact for Safe, Orderly, and Regular Migration, which I'll put, if I remember, I'll put a link to it in the description. Um, it's 34 pages long, and it consists of the following. And I drug myself through this, and it'd probably behoove you if you drug yourself through it. But it consists of a preamble, a vision, a cooperative framework, 23 objectives. Um, it's got a some implementation plan, a, and then follow up and review. So let's just kind of go through this. A little bit in the preamble, and I'm just gonna man, it's just gonna be a very cursory because it's 34 pages, right? Um, I'll read this one paragraph. It also rests on the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the International Covenant, and it lists all these documents, and then it gets into the Slavery Convention and the Supplementary Convention on the abolition of slavery, the slave trade, and institutions and practices similar to slavery. It's all, it's all about slavery. Well, who are these people that are coming into Europe? I mean, by, by and large, you know, they're Muslims. Um, Muslims killed 120 million blacks, or 120... 120 million blacks were killed by Muslim slavers. The United States imported 11 million slaves. Well, the Muslims had killed 120 million blacks. And I'm guessing that's primarily in Africa. I, I don't have that in front of me. but So, who gets blamed for all that? Well, the people with the deepest pockets, the United States. Uh... As a contribution to the preparatory process for this global compact, we recognize the inputs shared by member states and relevant stakeholders during the consultation and stock taking phrases, as well as the report of Secret the Secretary General making migration work for all. Well, who are these stakeholders? These stakeholders are referred to a lot in here. And, and there's a lot of a lot of organizations that are succinct in identifying, but this generic stakeholders is a lot. For instance, I was a big Agenda 21 guy, and, you know, stakeholders are PepsiCo and these major corporations. So. Uh, the Global Compact is a milestone in the history of global dialogue and international cooperation on migration. It is rooted in the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Man, we need to get our arms around that. And the Addis Adaba Action Agenda. Now, this Addis Adaba Action Agenda, it uh, aligns financial flows with the economic, social, and environmental prior priorities in support of Agenda 2030. We need to look at that one, too. This global, this global uh, compact presents a non-legally binding cooperative framework that builds on the commitment agreed upon by member states in the New York Declaration for Refugees and Migrants. It fosters international cooperation among all relevant actors on migration, acknowledging that no state can address migration alone. Oh, really? <laughs> so addresses address migration alone and upholds the sovereignty of the states and their obligations under international law. So, according to this, it's impossible for us to control our own migration. Yet, it's going it's going to observe our sovereignty. Well, how can you have it both ways? Talking out of both sides of your mouth. That's like, it's not legally binding, but it's a legal framework. Um, in the vision here, their vision, this global contact expresses our collective commitment to improving cooperation on international migration. Migration has been part of the human experience throughout history. And we recognize that it is a source of prosperity. It's a source of prosperity. 
60, you know, they just put this out in the news, 63% of migrants in the United States are on welfare. These people waiting at the border, some of them will be entitled to up to $3,800 a month. The average Social Security benefit for a, an American citizen, $1,200 a month. So they're a, source of, they're a source of prosperity, innovation, and sustainable development in our globalized world. And that these positive impacts can be optimized by improving migration governance. Yeah, we need another layer of government. The majority of migrants around the world today travel, live, and work in a safe, orderly, and regular manner. Nonetheless, migration undeniably affects our country's communities, migrants, and their families in very different and sometimes unpredictable ways. Um, this global... This global, continuing on in the vision, this global compact offers a 360 degree vision of international migration and recognizes that a comprehensive approach is needed to optimize the overall benefits of migration while addressing risks and challenges for individuals and communities in countries of origin, transit, and destination. And that's all throughout here. You have, you know, country of origin, transit, and then destination. No country can address the challenges and opportunities of this global phenomenon on its own. Huh, we're helpless. With this comprehensive approach, we aim to facilitate safe, orderly, and regular migration while reducing the incidence and negative impact of irregular migration through international cooperation and a combination of measures to put forward in this global compact. We acknowledge that our shared responsibilities to one another as member states of the United Nations to address each other's needs and concerns over migration in an overarching obligation to respect, protect, and fulfill the human rights of all migrants. Well, human rights of all men, of, uh, of all migrants. Well, where do these human rights come from? In our Declaration of Independence for the United States, it says they come from God. So, where do these rights come from? Um, you know, there's just, this is 34 pages. It's just, uh, nine cents. Um, so part of, I guess we're still in the vision. Yes, we're still in the vision. Human rights. The global compact is based on international human rights and upholds the principles of non-regression and non-discrimination. By implementing the global compact, we ensure effective respect, protection, and fulfillment of the human rights of all migrants, regardless of their migration status across all stages of the migration cycle. We also reaffirm the commitment to eliminate all forms of discrimination, including racism, xenophobia, and intolerance of migrants and their families. Well, I discriminate every day. I discriminate in the things I eat. I discriminate in the things that I purchase or don't purchase. What is the matter with why does this uh, word discrimination have such a horrible, you know, cloud around it? You know, we can, and I'm not saying, you know, we need to be, we need to do what scripture says in, in treating people. Um, I'm not, I'm not saying we shouldn't treat people right. But I am saying we don't need another government to tell our country how to treat people. And then it talks about this whole of government approach. The global comp compact considers that migration is a multidimensional reality that cannot be addressed by one government policy sector alone. To develop and implement effective migration policies and practices, a whole of government approach is needed to ensure horizontal and vertical policy coherences across all sectors and levels of government. So when horizontal and vertical. So the vertical, they're going to drill down and get into your business. Yeah, what else we got here?
And they're going to invest in programs that accelerate states' fulfillment of the Sustainable Development Goals with the aim of eliminating the adverse drivers and structural factors that compel people to leave their country of origin, including through poverty, eradication, food security, health and sanitation, education, inclusive economic growth. And yeah, they're going to, whose money are they going to invest? Then we get down here and they're going to invest in human, this is another one, they're going to invest in human capital development by promoting entrepreneurship, education, vocational training. Well, we took all the shops out, we took shop classes out of schools so they can't come to the United States and get vocational training. Okay. Uh, This is, this is under objective two. Uh, which is objective two, minimize the adverse drivers and structural factors that compel people to leave their country of origin. Um, strength. So there's a, this is a bullet strength and joint analysis and sharing of information to better map understand, predict, and address migration movements, such as those that may re result from sudden onset and slow onset natural disasters. The adverse effects of climate change, environmental degradation, as well as other precarious situations, while ensuring the effective respect, protection, and fulfillment of the human rights of all citizens. So these are big scary words, climate change, environmental degradation. And you know, back in 1987, Ronald Reagan said, Perhaps we need some outside threat to make us recognize this common bond. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. So this they've been planning a lot of this stuff for, for a long time, I do believe. Objective four, ensure that all migrants have proof of legal identity and adequate documentation. We commit to fulfill the right of all individuals to a legal identity, providing all our nationals with proof of nationality and relevant documentation. Can anybody say Revelations 13, 16 through 17? You know, the mark? You know, I don't know. But we'll get into it later. It's, there's more, they want more documentation on people. Well, they're gonna. So we're we're under objective five, which is uh, enhance availability and flexibility of pathways for regular migration. Develop. This is a bullet under that. Develop flexible and rights-based and gender-responsive labor mobility schemes for migrants in accordance with local and national labor market needs and skills supply at all skills levels, including temporary, seasonal, circular, circular and fast track programs in areas of labor shortages to provide flexible, convertible, and non-discriminatory visa and permit options such as permanent and temporary work, multiple entry study, business, visit investment, and entrepreneurship. So, you know, instead of having Congress voting on and a president signing these H-1Bs, we're just going to call up the UN and say, hey, you know, we need uh, uh, 23,000 software engineers. And they're going to say, oh, well, we have these guys, you know, from Bombay for you, or Bombay. And you know, this is all about, if you're in Agenda 21, it's all about getting rid of elected government and putting, putting bought off and paid for um, specialists in places of, of decision making. Man, this is just, it's just, it's just getting too long. Objective seven, address and reduce vulnerabilities in migration. Here's a bullet. 
Develop gender responsive migration policies to address the particular needs and vulnerabilities of migrant women, girls, and boys, which may include assistance, health care, um, psychological, and other counseling services. So there's numerous references to health care here that we owe these people health care. And, and lots of references to just women. So that's a pretty sexist document. Um, objective nine, strengthen the transnational response to the smuggling of migrants. We commit to intensify joint efforts to prevent and counter smuggling of migrants by strengthening capacities and international cooperation to prevent, investigate, prosecute, and penalize the smuggling of migrants in order to end the impunity of struggling networks. We further commit to ensure that migrants shall not become liable to criminal prosecution for the fact of having been the object of smuggling. Notwithstanding potential prosecution for other violations of national law. Well, if they paid a coyote to get them into this country, why aren't they liable for, for the smuggling? That's wrong. They're going to use transnational, regional, and bilateral mechanisms to share relevant information and intelligence on smuggling routes, modus operandi, and financial transactions of smuggling networks, vulnerabilities faced by smuggled migrants, and other data to dismantle the smuggling networks and enhance joint responses. <laughs> you know, if you've been watching the UN like I have over, you know, I'm 60 years old, 61. You know, these people couldn't, can't chew you know, bubble gum and, and walk at the same time. They're, and then under uh, Objective 11, which is manage borders in an integrated, secure, and coordinated manner, they're going to develop technical cooperation agreements that enable states to request and offer assets. Wow, they're going to let us offer assets to the United Nations. You know what? We've probably we've probably done enough of this. Man, I read this whole thing and I got notes and it's highlighted. And... But you just need to download a copy of this and read it yourself. Here's one thing. Here's one I really had a problem with. And this is under Objective Twenty One, which is cooperate in facilitating safe and dignified return and readmission as well as sustainable reintegration. So it's really about, you know, somebody going back to their country of origin. So it's uh, cooperate on identification of nationals and issuan issuance of travel documents for safe and dignified return and readmission in cases since that do not have the legal right to stay on another state's territory by establishing reliable and efficient means of identification of own nationals, such as through the addition of biometric identifiers in population registries, and by digitizing, digi, digitalizing, digitalizing civil registry systems with full respect to the right and privacy of protection of personal data. This is the only mention of this. They want biometric identification on, on the world, the population of the world. I mean, it have to be, because we're all going to be migrants, right? Um, mm -mm -mm. And, you know, and there's, there's a law among database developers, and that law is every piece of information will be used to the equal and opposite reason for the database being developed, okay? So in the implementation plan, I got a, I got, we I got a kick out of this a little bit. We will implement the global compact in cooperation and partnership with migrants, civil society, migrant and diaspora organizations, faith-based organizations, local authorities and communities, the private sector, trade unions, a little bit of Marxism there, parliamentarians, national human rights institutions, the International Red Cross and the Red Crash, the Red Crescent movement. 
you know, if you get into the Quran chapter 4, I think it's verse 89 or so, you're killing infidels. So, so but we're going to get help. We're going to get help from them. So I, I won't I won't drag you through any more of that nonsense. Um, let me get my my cheat sheet here. A uh, couple of points, a few points I wanted to make. You know, immigration could be the coup de grace for this country. The middle class has already moved to Asia. You know, they have you convinced. They're trying to convince people. If you make twenty-four thousand dollars a year, <laughs> you're middle class. But uh, we know that's not the case. This document reeks with hubris. If you've watched UN actions around the globe for years, like I have, you know the UN is guilty of everything in this document. They say they're trying to protect people from um, The UN claims it loves diversity. By its actions, we know it hates diversity. It wants the same homogenous mass in every country. The Most High broke up people at the Tower of Babel, which created countries. And the UN is trying to put it together again. I don't know about Babel, but trying to, you know, this oneness they're trying. And then this, this is just kind of a point I was wondering at. During the millennium, how much of a new world order will there be? There seems to be some leeway for the unwise. Zechariah 14, 18 says, And if the family of Egypt go not up, and come not that have no rain, there shall be plague wherewith um, the Lord, the Lord, will smite the heathen that come up not to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. So evidently, you know, you have an option to keep the Feast of Tabernacles if, if you don't want plague and you do want rain. I don't know. Um, here's another point. If it comes from someone else, it's not a right. This is civil rights for foreigners on steroids. And, you know, and they should know. They should be apprised that caution what the government giveth, the government can take and take much more back. That's the people in the Warsaw. Um, there's a couple more points there, but I've already mentioned them. I would like to read this little letter. Maybe some of you saw it. And the letter signed by 11 general officers and, and three or four other people in France. And it's to Macron, which I believe signed this. You are about to sign the global compact to their president or prime minister, Macron, whatever he is. You are about to sign the global compact on safe, orderly, and regular migration on 10 and 11 December, which establishes a genuine right to migration. It may impose itself on our national legislation through pre-existing treaties or the principle of common response is set out in this pact. It seems to me that the only sovereignty that will remain with France will co consist in freely setting the way in which the objectives of the pact will have to be implemented. You cannot give up this new part of the national sovereignty without a public debate, whereas 80% of the French population considers that it is necessary to stop or regulate drastically immigration. By deciding alone to sign this pact, you would add on you would add an additional reason for revolt to the anger of an already battered people. You would be guilty of a denial of democracy or treason against the nation. So here's 11 general officers. And they're, you know, I look, they're being considered for uh, military um, justice in France. Sign on, accusing, in essence, accusing their leader of treason. In addition, the finances of our country are drained and our debt is growing. You cannot take the risk of an expensive call for air migration with, yeah, they're going to fly these people in, without first showing that you will not have to resort to more taxes to meet the objectives of the pact. On the other hand, you must be able, in terms of security, to curb the consequences linked in the arrival of extra European populations. Finally, you cannot ignore the very essence of politics is to ensure security on the outside and harmony within. However, this concord can be obtained only if it maintains a certain internal coherence of the society alone capable of allowing to want to do it together, which is becoming more and more problematic today. In fact, the French state is late in coming to realize the impossibility of integrating too many people 
in addition to totally different cultures who have regrouped in the last 40 years in areas that no longer submit to laws of the Republic. You cannot decide alone to erase our civilized landmarks and deprive us of our carnal homeland. We therefore ask you to refer the signing of this pact and call by referendum the French to vote on this document. You are accountable to the French for your actions. Your election is not a blank check. We support the initiative of General Martinez against the signature of this pact, which must be adopted by the member states of the UN at the Intergovernmental Conference of Marrakech. And I guess that's a location. So the French aren't too excited about that. So next I would like to read um, what George Washington said about this in his farewell address of 1796. He said, Our detached and distant situation invites and enable us to pursue a different course. You know, we've got this ocean separating us. If we remain one... If we remain one people under an efficient government, the period is not far off when we may defy the material injury from external annoyance. When we may take such an attitude as will cause the neutrality, we may at any time resolve upon to be scrupulously respected. When belligerent nations, under the impossibility of making acquisitions upon us, will not lightly hazard the giving us provocation, when we may choose peace or war as our interest, guided by justice, shall counsel. Why forego the advantages of so peculiar a situation? Why quit our own to stand upon foreign ground? Why, by interweaving our destiny with that of any part of Europe, entangle our peace and prosperity in the toils of European ambition, rivalship, interest, humor, or caprice? So I think we know which way George would have voted. In conclusion, I classify my opinion of this effort, I mean, what's the real goal of this, into three categories. It's, I think, on the best end of the spectrum, the least injurious end of the spectrum, this effort is more of the same. It's trying to entangle countries in their web and just, you know, consolidate and get more power. My middle-of-the-road scenario is they think they're close to standing up H.W. Bush's New World Order. You know, this is uh, this will give them teeth and uh, control in some aspects of individual governments. Now, in the worst end of the spectrum, and this might be out there, um, they are aware of massive shifts in the earth that will force millions to relocate. Um, in Deagle.com, D-E-A-G-E-L.com, it predicts the population of the United States at 99.5 million people. Well, what happened to the other, the other 220 million? And they mealy mouth about immigration and stuff. Well, I thought that was mealy mouth when I read it a long time ago. But maybe, you know, maybe there's something to that. It's, I believe it's in Isaiah. It talks, you know, in the end times, the earth's going to reel to and fro as like a drunkard. So maybe, maybe millions of people will be moving around. So... Those, that's what I think about it, you know, it's my two cents. And I'm just thankful that President Trump refused to sign this right off the bat. So uh, thanks for listening, and uh, put your comments below. Let me know what you think.